my guest today is listed as one of the most powerful women in the world. But by her own admission, she struggled to embrace and accept her success, her achievements, and her power. As she put down her journey of getting to the boardroom, Cheryl Sandberg has started an honest and a controversial conversation about why women fail to reach positions of power. To take that conversation forward, joining us on this very special show is Cheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Facebook and the author of the best-selling Lean In. Cheryl, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Let me talk to you about India and your impressions of India. You've been a visitor to India in your previous job at Google and now you're here with uh, Lean In and Facebook. Are you a big believer in the India story and the resilience of the Indian economy? Oh, absolutely. I started my career here. I worked from 1991 till 1993 for the World Bank on the India Health Team. And I worked on leprosy. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a lot of time in places like Madhya Pradesh. And I've seen firsthand how a country that was committed to curing a public health problem did. There were three or four million cases then. Today there are less than 100,000. And if that's not a story of resilience and commitment and growth, I don't know what is. But what makes you so confident and so bullish about India? And I'm not just talking specifically from a Facebook point of view because it is one of your most important markets. But what is it about India that is unique in the emerging market basket at this point in time? The largest democracy in the world, a thriving democracy filled with people who are really dedicated, really perseverant, and really resilient. When I used to come here in the early 1990s, there was no internet. Mm. Today, both in my experience at Google and now in my experience at Facebook, India is not just a place that's growing its own economy, but we have one of our four global centers of operations here. And we're using the talent of India to grow our business here, but also to grow our business around the world. It's an incredible global economic growth story. Okay, let's now talk about Lean In. And, you know, I was going through the Forbes uh, power list for 2014, and I know you're embarrassed about being put down on these power lists, but nevertheless, if I look at what that power list shows up, Sheryl Sandberg at number nine, IBM CEO Virginia Ramotti at 10, there's the Google CEO, there's Marissa Mayer at uh, Yahoo, there's Meg Whitman at HP. And if one looks at that list, you tend to believe that all is well with the world. But the reality is very different, isn't it? Things haven't really changed. We haven't seen rapid strides as far as women entering the workforce and the boardroom what's gone wrong and you talk about that in your book that the promise of the feminist revolution has gone wrong that we've stalled what's the reason behind that so we did make progress for many decades and it's obvious that things are better than they were before but we have stalled over the last decade progress for women in boardrooms progress for women in top jobs it's been pretty stagnant and I think we got rid of some of the barriers mm. We still have more barriers to get rid of, both institutional and public policy, but we also really need to address our culture. I asked women in a speech I gave here today, I asked people in the room, men, raise your hand if you've ever been told you're too aggressive at work. No hands. I've done that all over the world. You get one or two male hands at best. Women, raise your hand if you've been told you're too aggressive at work. Every hand goes up. We know that men are more aggressive than women when it's actually measured fairly, but we expect leadership from men and we don't expect it from women. And that is why women have a hard time leading. We need to change that. You know, talking about change, and uh, the world has now sort of come to be divided over the last two years in the Sheryl Sandberg <laughs> Lean-In camp and the Anne-Marie Slaughter, you can't have it all camp. Uh, and the truth perhaps lies somewhere in between. While uh, there is one camp that believes you need to do much more in terms of public policy and institutional reform, you're saying, and you acknowledge very clearly, you're not denying the fact that there is a glass ceiling, but you believe that women need to do more, that the onus is really on women on pushing the envelope. But the truth, as I said, is somewhere in between. How do we address that? So I think, and I said this in my book, it's both. It absolutely is institutional reform and public policy reform around the world and it's also individual action. And I think we need both, they go hand in hand. I also think we need to change our vocabulary and expectations for women. Mm. Even the phrase, women can't have it all, no one ever says that about men. No one ever says men can't have it all. They can, they do. They work and have children, but we assume that women can't. And I think we need to change our assumptions of what women can't do to what they can. Mm. But in changing that assumption, you need, to, you need to sort of 
do away with centuries of societal <laughs> conditioning. I mean, you know, women can't have it all. Uh, you, you talk about it in the book about how your parents told you that while you need to focus on your education and you need to focus on academic achievements, you also need to figure <laughs> out getting a guy as soon as you graduate because the good guys are going to get taken up. Uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, it's just so uh, part of the DNA and part of the culture. So culture is used in many ways as an excuse to hang on to things that we shouldn't hang on to and in some ways there are things we do want to hang on to in our culture people say all the time that it's natural in the human condition for women to do more at home and men i think what's even more core to the human condition is our desire to treat people equally and mm. fairly but it's not a myth core. Is, is an equal opportunity workplace a myth or a reality today today it is a it, it is a myth but it is becoming increasingly and can become increasingly a, a reality. Let me give you an example. Mm. If you go back to aggressive, rather than tell women we're too aggressive, we could teach everyone that words like aggressive and bossy are used for girls. And then we could say, actually, she's not aggressive. She's results oriented. Mm. I tell people, next time you see a little girl called bossy, you walk up to the person who said it and you say, that little girl's not bossy. That little girl has executive leadership skills. Mm. You know, while it is going to take changing the vocabulary, it is going to change, uh, it is going to need change in terms of being able to boost the supply pipeline. Let me give you an example of, of, of Facebook and uh, most organizations at this point in time have diversity leaders, have diversity councils and so on and so forth. But the reality is that it still is largely a male dominated environment. Whether you look at the tech staff or you look at the management positions, 87% of Facebook's employees continue to be male with you as the chief operator officer how do you explain that so tech has a specific problem which is that such a small percentage of women going into computer science in the United States and India less than 20% yeah. of the degrees are women but I'll give you something optimistic our operations in India are led by two women our two most senior employees are women Anki who runs our public policy Kirthaga who runs our global sales that's an example that we can follow and as I was visiting our offices here I was so proud that we have so many women at all levels of the organization, mm. including the top. But what is it going to mean in terms of changing the environment in the workplace? And I ask you this again in the context of Facebook and perhaps in, in terms of what you're doing to change the numbers, because you acknowledge that this is a problem, especially as far as the United States is concerned. When, and you talk about a bunch of conversations that you've had with male CEOs in the book, uh, John Chambers for one, uh, who says that we need to change the way we deal with women or That's the right. way we work with women. What does that mean exactly? I think it means making gender an active conversation from the point of view of competitive advantage. That rather than pretend gender doesn't exist and pretend we're treating people equally because we're not, let's acknowledge that we need to do more to encourage women to have the same opportunities as men. So for example, we know that women are the ones who give birth, that women need maternity leave. Have we made it fair for women to re-enter mm. and have the same opportunities? We know that women need more flexibility, and men do too if they're going to be parents. And importantly, we know that there are these biases against women leading mm. that we can change by educating. John Chambers stood on a stage looking at his senior staff and said, we've called every woman here too aggressive, we're sorry, and we're never going to do it again. That's pretty powerful stuff from a mm. CEO, and lots of companies can do that. There is a business case to hire more, more women. There's a business case to put women in the boardroom. I mean, I can quote Absolutely. study after study, whether it's the Credit Suisse Research Institute, it's Ernst & Young, uh, it's Catalyst. There is a business case to have more women in the boardroom because on an average, on every financial parameter possible, uh, companies that hire more women in leadership positions have outperformed, have done better. Why don't people get it? Because change takes time, and we have to convince people and show them it's possible. But I think we are seeing that it's a competitive advantage, and I think companies need to understand that. I also think that's important at the national public policy level. Mm. If you look at economic growth in every country, this one, mine, we're all very concerned with economic growth, with job creation, you see how important women are to that. And so India's ability to grow its economy is going to be dependent on the participation of women as is the United States is. So 
is the U.S. likely to go down the quota route? Because we've seen the EU move towards the quota route. Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, while we talk about these hypothetical targets, these targets can only be real. Now people are saying, if you mandate this behavior, uh, the EU has moved forward. You've had a lot of Scandinavian countries who've actually shown very good results because they've actually had quotas in place. India is experimenting that for the very first time now with our new company's law. Do you believe the time is right now for the U.S. to start considering quotas? Do you believe in quotas? for women in the boardroom? I believe we have to get to equality in every country, in every company, in every government, in every nonprofit. And obviously, there are so many differences legally and otherwise. People will each have to do it in their own way. But here's what I also believe. Quotas can be very effective, but they're never sufficient. Mm. And the best example of this in the world is Norway. Norway has in many ways one of the best public policies in the world for women. They've had quotas for their parliament and their board at 40% for over a decade, and that's what they have. 3% of the top Norwegian companies are run by women. 3%. Yeah. So getting 40% onto the boards actually has not moved the numbers at all. So you're at saying it doesn't really level. matter if you do have a mandatory quota or not? I'm saying we have to get to equality, and some countries and companies will use quotas, some won't, but we also have to address the stereotypes and the cultural expectations as well. Sure. I, I mean, while you do have to address the stereotypes, but that takes time. And at this point in time, when you've been stagnant on every parameter for almost a decade, is there a need to crack the whip? Is there a need to mandate this? It's really different in different, in different places. I don't think in the United States quotas are the most important thing. I think addressing uh, some of the really deep-seated cultural barriers is super important. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to see addressed at this point in time, to see more women move to the top in leadership roles in corporate America? And, and you know, there's so much similarity uh, in terms of the barriers that women face everywhere in the world. What do you think needs to be addressed at this particular point in time, besides addressing the stereotypes? Yeah. So the first thing is we have to recognize that there's stagnation. When I first wrote Lean In a year ago and I would say, we've made no progress in 10 years, people would look at me, really? I didn't know that was true. So let's first acknowledge there's a problem because we're not going to fix it if we can't acknowledge it. The second is we need to make gender something we discuss and debate and, and address. So in my career, no one ever talked about it. I never talked about it until four or five years ago. Mm. We're not going to change the issues that women face by not addressing them in the first place. And so I'm really happy that the conversation is alive. I also think we need to give both individuals and company action. So along with the book, I started the foundation, leanin.org, help start Lean In Circles, a group of, you know, 10 people who get together once a month. We were hoping for 1,000 in a year. It's been a little over a year. There are almost 18,000 in 72 countries, including here. I met with some yesterday. Companies are using Lean In Circles because when there's a lot of circles, people start talking about gender and mm. people are able to raise and address issues. But do you think one of the problems is, and I pick up on what you just said, that uh, even before you actually started writing the book, uh, you were worried about how you would be perceived <laughs> if you were honest about it. And is the problem, uh, you know, about where we are today and the revolution having stalled with the fact that women leaders have refrained from actually having an honest, real conversation about the workplace and the challenges and the problems that they face in the workplace. Well, I think that's changing. And they've made it look too easy. Well, I think that's changing. And Indra Nuri, who's, you know, an Indian national who's now American, gave a very honest interview just in the last couple of days on this as well. Lean in is my story. I really tried to be honest about the challenges and the, the things I still have to overcome. And so I think this can change. And I think as we form circles, as we just that this isn't good enough, we are stagnating, we can change it. But we'll only change it if we first acknowledge it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So how much are you leaning in today? <laughs> do, you, do you still feel like an imposter at work at some particular <laughs> point in time that you're going to be caught out? Uh, or, or have you dealt with that? Now, do you embrace your success much more? No, I mean, I still faced this yesterday. Yesterday with my team here, all women, very proud. I was driving, we were driving from one meeting to another, and I said something, and one of my colleagues looked at me and said, you wouldn't say that if you were a man, you would be fine. She's like, lean in, Cheryl. I'm like, you're right. And I said that back to her the day before. I still face this. Mm -hmm. I still sometimes feel insecure and like an imposter, but then I remember that I'm sitting next to a man who's much less likely to face that. And I remember that I can sit at the table and use my voice, and I'm hoping that lean in and all the great work so many other women and men are doing mm. 
gets everyone to believe and every woman to believe that she can do anything she wants to do. You know, in the book you talk about how women react to situations differently and how we constantly uh, second guess ourselves. There's always self-doubt because we feel that we're being judged uh, all the time. Uh, let me ask you uh, about your experience post the Facebook IPO, which is a difficult phase for the company. Mm -hmm. Did you deal with it differently uh, than perhaps Mark and the rest of the team, mm -hmm. the men on the team? Mm -hmm. uh, did you, in a sense, feel personally responsible for what was happening with the Facebook IPO? You know, Mark and I are uh, great colleagues. He's a great boss and we're great partners. And I think we really help each other. As we've gone through difficult times, the transition to mobile going right, as you said, at the time we went public, uh, we've had each other and the great team that surrounds us, uh, that surrounds us to rely on. It is definitely the case that compared to the men I work with, there are still many moments where I feel they have more self-confidence than I do. I have new stories every week, but I can also learn from those experiences. And I think at Facebook, we have a very active lean in conversation going on. People say all the time, you need to lean in to women and sometimes to men as well. Mm. And I think that's helping us. So what are you doing specifically at Facebook to get women to lean in? And uh, you know, one issue, as we pointed out, is the supply issue where you don't have enough women graduating with computer science degrees and so on and so forth. Are you looking to address that as well? Yes. We're working uh, with a number of organizations, Grace Hopper, Anita Borg, uh, both Facebook and the Lean In Foundation work together to form Lean In circles through computer science departments. Mm. Uh, and we're working on that as well. We definitely have to address the pipeline. We have to address the pipeline by convincing girls that they can code, convincing girls that they should code. It's also really important that we let our girls embrace technology. Everywhere in the world, we're more protective of our daughters than our sons. And that means often we take the computer away from our daughters, we take the phone away from our daughters, and we hand it to our sons. Who do you think is going to become the computer scientist? Mm. And so, Everyone needs children to be safe online, and we care a lot about this, but we also need to believe our daughters can code as well as our sons. But what about the messaging, you know, in the media, and the girls are supposed to like the pretty things, play with the Barbie dolls, and so on and so forth, and that myth of girls being a certain way, the stereotype gets yes. perpetuated every day, whether it's your movies, it's your magazines, it's yes. so on and so forth. How do you cope with that? Well, it needs to change. So. I serve on the Disney board, and the last two big Disney films that have come out are Frozen and Maleficent. And without giving it away for any of your uh, what, audience... What, what, what was the brief that you gave them? That what would you I, not I, accept? I, what was non-negotiable? I, I, I do not get to make the movies I just said on the board, but those two movies are feminist movies. If you watch both of those movies, hmm. both in the characters, both in the plot line, both in what happens without giving it away, they're strong feminist statements. They are women helping other women. They are movies which are about the strength between women rather than being saved by a man. And so I think the culture is changing. It's also interesting that Frozen is the biggest global success in animation ever, ever. Feminist animation. Mm. No, you know, again, I don't want to give away the end, but this isn't about kissing the prince. Yeah. But you know, and it's feminism. But the trouble of, <laughs> of sort of being in these two extremes, the, the damsel in distress to the superwoman, there's nothing in the middle. I think if you see these movies, they're, 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 uh, I, I'm, they're not, I'm not talking about movies, but I'm no. again talking about the stereotypes that women, I mean, you've got, either got to be Mother Teresa or you've got to be Angelina Jolie. You know, what, what do we do to find ourselves a, a nice middle? More women. Because there aren't enough of us. There aren't enough women in your job, in my job. And so the very few there are, everyone wants you to be representative of everything. We never do that to men. We just accept there are lots of different male leaders, lots of different ways of doing things. There's lots of different ways of being a male CEO. If there were just more women, we would stop having one woman represent so many because there would be variety. And that's what it's, why it's important to get more women. But are you, feeling, are you feeling confident, Cheryl, that we are going to see these numbers change? We haven't seen any difference in the last decade in the number of women in C-suites, yep. in the number of <laughs> women in board positions, in the, number, in, in the compensation that women get. Uh, incremental difference over the past decade. Do you really feel confident that we're going to, we're on the cusp of big change? I hope so. Yesterday, I sat down in Gurga with two lean-in circles, both of which had both women and a few men in them. And they talked about what's happened since they formed their circles. And all of them said 
They were reaching for more opportunities, getting raises, believing they could do things. The men said they were more cognizant of the dynamics for women at work. So yes, I think this can change because as you point out, there's good reason for it to change because it's going to improve our economic performance. So what about the criticism that's come your way that you're perpetuating this myth <laughs> of superwoman, you know, someone who can juggle all the balls <laughs> all the time and still get it right and, and show up uh, at work calm, cool and collected? Uh, so anyone who's read my book knows that that's not the portrayal of myself. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> of myself. But I think we need to acknowledge that women need more help in the workplace and we need more help at home. And I say this in the book, we need our jobs to be more flexible. And we need to ask for help. Correct. And we need to help each other. And we need men to help us. I say in the book, it should be a badge of honor for senior people, including men, because most of the people are senior people are men, to mentor young women, to help get them up the ranks. And we need our husbands and partners to do more at home. Hmm. As long as women have two jobs, out of the home and in the home, and men have one, we'll never get to equality. That needs to change too. Is that changing? I mean, you're lucky. It can. You're lucky because you do have a partner <laughs> who, who's pitching in at work and at home. But uh, do you really see the balance changing? Because uh, women continue to be the primary caregivers yeah. and the men the providers. Or that's the stereotype that continues to exist. Yep. So my marriage didn't start out that way. And I'm really honest about it in the book. When Dave and I had our first child, I found myself doing the great, great, great majority, and we had to work it out to get to more equality, but I think we're happy. The reason I think men are going to step up and do more is because it's good for their children. At any income level, regardless of how active a mother is involved, children with more involved fathers do better at work, do better professionally, do better in school, and have better relationships. That is really compelling. I can't tell you how many men have written into Lean In or written stories or reached out to me or the Lean In team and said, I have a daughter. Thank you. I want the world to be more even for her. That's pretty powerful. So for the single women and the women who are graduating <laughs> today, uh, what's your advice to them? Don't worry, there's enough good men out there. Isn't yes, be picky. Be picky. The person you choose to marry is the single most important choice you will make. There was actually a great ad done by matrimony.com here mm. about a husband who his wife wanted to work and he was standing up to his parents and defending her choice. Those men are out there. They're in every country. And I think if parents are picking spouses for their children, we should be sorting for that. <laughs> and if people are picking spouses for themselves, we should be looking for that. Let's look for equality. Well, in the quest for equality, Cheryl, what has been the biggest lesson that you've learned? Uh, you know, as you've written Lean In, as you've traveled across the world, met women with di from different backgrounds, but with similar experiences, what's been your biggest lesson? I guess the universality of two things. The first is how universal the cultural stereotypes are for men and women all around the world, despite all of these huge differences between America and India and China and Europe. Yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think your assumptions. parents were going to give you a hard time about getting married. I thought that, that was an Indian thing. <laughs> That's it, right? Everywhere in the world that I meet women, we all say, I've had the same experience. And so the cultural similarities. But the second is the universality of people wanting a better life for their children. All of us, all of us as parents, we all want our sons and daughters to have equal opportunity. We all want better opportunities for our children and a better, fairer, and more just world. And I think in the end, mm. that's our deepest need. Our deepest need is to treat each other equally and fairly, and that will win out over any other. Well, speaking of an equal world, we now have Janet Yellen at the head uh, of the Fed. Do you believe America is ready for a woman in the White House? I hope so. I hope so. One of the reasons I wrote Lean In is my daughter at four learned a song with all the U.S. presidents and looked up and said, Mommy, why are they all boys? India has had a female president. India has Prime had Minister. And, and Prime Minister. Yeah. India's had a female president and India's had a female Prime Minister. And that matters, but right now there are 18 female heads of state in hundreds of countries. Mm. We can change this. But do you believe America's ready to make that change? I hope so. I'm certainly ready. <laughs> is a political but I believe career America something is. that you would aspire to do? It's not for me, but I do think it's really important that more women run for office. One of the most fun things that's happened since Lean In was published is how many women actually read the book and do choose to serve to serve and to run, and that's been really fun to see. So it's not something that you would consider <laughs> in the future? I'm helping other people think about it.
Sheryl Sandberg, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Thank you for leaning in <laughs> and for getting all of us to consider leaning in as well. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you for having me. Well, with that, it's time for us to wrap up this show. We'll see you again next week. Till then, from the entire team, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.